I got a sprout on my head still. Yeah, I do. You do have a sprout. We're both sprouts today. We've just um, had a lot of fun with video this, filters. This is a, in honor of alfalfa. Um, I don't know if it's an alfalfa sprout. To be honest, it looks, I don't know, quite like a broad bean, maybe sprout. Anyway, we're very, we're really into the, um, the sort of cheek blusher. Actually, come to think of it, I don't think it's Brussels sprouts. I think it's a yeah, sprout. I, I never thought it was a Brussels sprout. I can still oh. be a Brussels sprout. It's just a sprout, you know, like an alfalfa sprout or a bean sprout or a, um, a sprout, sprout when your potatoes are growing or a uh, sprout when your flowers are growing. Not a I thought sprout. this was the Brussels bit and this was the sprout. No, although it's a good question about what this is. I think this is maybe all the energy happening underground. Oh, right, okay. Anyway, so here we okay. are. Well, you know, maybe we can all play with Zoom filters together and we get on the Zoom call. Okay, right. Here we go. The Fire of Life, part two. Luca in the Fire of Life. Luca in the Fire do we, of Life. Do we remember what happened in the in the in ah. our last video? No. First half of this chapter. He went left instead of right. Which took some... Which took some about. thought process. Um, there was a lot of um, very complicated deities. And they were all chasing after and them. They were all and chasing. Decoy, coyote, and yeah. like this crowd of other people. And other then animals. there was the really, really big mountain that had kind of no way to climb it with a completely smooth face, which is why he had to go left instead of right. Yeah. He didn't want to accept a lift from, uh, was it yeah. the dragons? The dragons. That would be cheating, which I thought was interesting because I think it's quite important that he just makes it to the top. But, I, I'm, you know, he's obviously proud. No, there was a legitimate reason. Was there? Oh. I think it's that you have to do it on your own. Ah, okay. And he was like, a workaround will just mean that I lose some lives. Mm. Okay, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Now he loses a hundred lives every time he does something wrong. Yeah, so he's not got that many. So lives he's only yet. got four more turns left, basically. And Ella, we're only one chapter away from the end after this, so we'll see how it all goes. Okay. Here we go. Be prepared for some strange languages. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the thundering herd of ex-gods arrived at Mount Knowledge and found two of the brightest stars of the great rings of fire the defunct surface circus of Captain Arg, waiting for them as calmly as the experienced artists they were, and gesturing courteously to their outside audience to settle down. Bear the singing dog, and Dog the dancing bear, had taken up their starting positions, along with their backing singers, the changers, a quartet of giant metallic sows. Oh, maybe. <laughs> along with their backing singers, the changers, a quartet of giant metallic sows. So I think their backing singers on metal pegs. Mm, yes, I think so too. The sight was unusual enough to stop the discarded deities in their tracks. Ra, the Supreme, held up his hand and all the ranks of all the former gods, Egyptian, Asrium, Norse, Greek, Roman, Aztec, Inca, and the rest came clattering to a clumsy halt full of screeches, collisions, and oaths. The Cyclops accidentally elbowed one and another in the eye. The Fire God's burning swords singed the hair of the treasure nymphs. A basilisk glared at a griffin and accidentally turned it to stone. The beauty goddesses, Aphrodite, coward Hather and the rest complained loud. Cow-eared Hather and the rest complained loudest. It appeared that the lower ranked supernatural entities were taking advantage of the crowd of immortals to squeeze the, be squeeze the beauty's bottoms accidentally on purpose. Also, why exactly were Minotaur stepping on the lovely lady's feet? And no, the beauties absolutely did not appreciate snake-headed deities from rival mythological traditions looking up their togas. A little space, please, they demanded, a little respect, and shh, by the way, they hissed. There were performers here, and they were ready to begin. Higgly said Ra, have there been a higgly big higgly here? It looks like that, Ella. <laughs> that bit there. What on earth was that? asked Bear the dog. He's speaking hieroglyph, said Newthol. And what he says is, okay, this had better be good. Start dancing, murmured Bear the dog to Dog the Bear, and dance as you've never danced before. And you start singing, growled Dog the Bear to Bear the dog. Sing as if your life depended on it. Which, 
In point of fact, it does. Of course, new thug Sarah, bad low and gin. And ours too, by the way. New thug added, no pressure though, break a leg. So Dr. Bear began to dance. First, a soft shoe shuffle, then a rhythm tap, and then the African gumboot dance. Once he had warmed up, he went into the Broadway style and at last his show-stopping speciality in the Caribbean juba. The most energetic tap dance of them all. The audience went crazy. He had them right where he wanted them. As, he tap as his feet tapped, so did the feet of the ex-gods. As his hands clapped, so, they so the junked deities clapped along. And when he whirled the tuba, tuba twirl, well, those ancient relics discovered they could still get down a boogie. Rather Supreme clapped right along with everyone else. He roared. <laughs> and Guy Rajin translated, he says, you make my pants want to get up and dance. <laughs> Dr. Bear shook his head in wonder. But he's wearing any pants, he pointed out. Just that little loincloth sort of thing. And that doesn't exactly hide very much, agreed Bear the dog, but let's yeah, not argue. Your turn now, said Dog the Bear to Bear the dog. And the dog murmured, Let's try a little flat out flattery. After all, uh, after all, it's probably been a while since anyone worshipped these folks properly. Then he cleared his throat <clears throat> and burst into howlful melody, singing a series of honeyed odes to the gods of Babylon, Egypt, Asgard, Greece and Rome, improvised from less specifically reverential tunes. When I wish upon Ishtar, it's a beautiful fray, long winded adulation goes to Memphis on the Nile, and so on. The show seemed to go well, and he launched into his big finish. The metal sounds oohed and clanged behind him. You're divine, sang Bear the Dog, and the clangs chorused ooh, clang, ooh, clang, ooh. Your level nine, sang Bear the Dog. Ooh, can, ooh, can, ooh. Your gorgeous gods of mine, I really want to praise you. Really, I'm amazed by you. Ooh, I really want to place now, because you look so fine, my gods. Ooh, clang, ooh, clang, ooh, <laughs> my sweet gods. Ooh, clang, ooh, clang, ooh, ooh, clang, ooh, clang. My god, there was interrupted by an angry roar and a golden blaze of light. Rather supreme, broke the spell of music, rose into the sky, glowing furiously and shot like a bullet towards the summit of that knowledge. All the other ex-gods soared after him, looking like the grandest firework display in world, in world history. Bear the dog looks disconsolate. Dis consulate. Disconsolate. I lost my audience, he said sadly. Dog the bear confronted him, comforted him. It wasn't you. Something just happened up there. He said, maybe it was something good. Let's hope we brought young Luca enough time. An enormous white horse with eight legs galloped towards him, snorting angrily. Let's go and see if you did, shall we? He said, by which I mean you're both under arrest. This was the real Slippy, King of the Horses, and he didn't look at all pleased to see them. As for you and your sisters, he said to Garajin and the other changers, you should consider yourself seized as well. We'll decide about what, what to do about you later, but treason, may I remind you, is not a minor offence. When Lucas saw the rhyming... Uh, a bime of time. A bime of time, thank you. <laughs> when Lucas saw the rhyming a bime of time ahead of him, he didn't slow down because now at last he could feel the ghostly pressure on his shoulder that told him that left-hand dimension was right there, right beside him. So he ran even faster and then at the edge of the abime, he hurled himself to the left and fell into the bottomless pit. And as he plummeted through the blackness, flew apart into million shiny fragments. When he came to his senses, his life counter has subtracted 100 lives. Oh no. He was running at the abime again and again throwing himself left at that sort of, at that area of soft pressure and again toppling into blackness and disintegrating. And the third time the same thing happened again this time when the shiny fragments of himself reformed and he saw that a total of 300 lives had evaporated in just a few inst instances. Leaving him with only 165, he lost his temper. That's pathetic, Luca Khalifa, to be honest with you, he scolded himself. If you can't be serious now, after coming so far, then you deserve the final permination you're about to receive. 
Just then, a red squirrel ran across his path from left to right at the very edge of the abime and simply disappeared into thin air. Oh my goodness, Luke thought. I don't even, I don't even know if there are such things as left-handed, left-footed squirrels. But if, if there are, then this was surely one of them. And it's amazing how easily it hopped across onto the left-hand path without even trying. Obviously, when you really and truly believe it's there, you can scurry across onto it without the slightest difficulty whenever you feel the urge. Whereupon, following the squirrel's example, Luca Khalifa simply turned to the left and took a step without even needing to stumble, stepped into the left-handed version of the magic world in which the mountain was completely different. As a matter of fact, it was no longer a mountain at all, but a low green hill dotted with oaks and elms and china trees and stands of poplars and flower bushes around which honeybees buzzed, hummingbirds tongue, larks warbled melodiously, while crested orange hoopoes, hoopoes strutted like princes on the grass, and there was a pretty path curling around it to the left, a path which looked like it might take Luca all the way to the top. I always knew the left-hand world would be much easier for me to handle than the right-hand one. If I could just find my way there, Luca thought happily, I bet you that if there was a doorknob anywhere around here, it would turn to the left. It seems that even knowledge itself is not such a huge frightening mountain when the world is arranged to suit us lefties for a change. The red squirrel was waiting for him on a low tree stump, nibbling at an acorn. Greetings from King Queen Saraya, she said, bowing formally. Ratatat's the name. Oh yes, Her Majesty the Insultana thought you might appreciate a little guidance. She certainly has friends everywhere, Luca marvelled. We redheads like to stick together, said Ratatat, bristling with pressure. And some of us, I don't want to boast, but there it is, are honorary otters, a long-standing, oh yes, members of the highly confidential ot list. The Insultana's emergency undercover squadron, sleeper agents, if you will, lurking in our secret ot beds and available to the lady 24-7 on her personal offline, just in case she needs to activate us. But much as I'd like to stop and chat about these odd topics, I do believe you might be in something of a hurry. So, she went on quickly, noticing that Luke had opened his mouth to reply and obliging him to shut it again, let's odd foot it up this so old mountain while we can. Wow, it's going well all of a sudden. Okay. <clears throat> Luca almost skipped up that hill, so great was his determination and joy. He had jumped to the left from a mountain of difficulty to a hill of ease, and the fire of life lay within his grasp. Soon he would be rushing home as fast as he could go to pour the fire into his father's mouth, and then Rashid Khalifa would surely awake, and there would be new stories told, and Saraya, his mother, would sing. You do know, said Rasatat the Squirrel, that there will be guards. Guards? Luca stopped dead in his tracks and almost shrieked the word because somehow he hadn't been expecting to encounter any further obstacles. Not here in the left-hand dimension, surely not. Happiness drained from him like blood from a wound. You wouldn't expect the fire of life to be left unguarded, would you? Said Ratatat sternly, as if lecturing a slightly dim-witted student. Are there fire gods in this magic world too? Asked Luca, and then felt so foolish he actually blushed. Well, yes, I suppose there must be, but... They all somewhere else right now, guarding the Rainbow Bridge or searching for, well, for me, I suppose. As well as fire gods, said Ratatat, there are fire guards. Oh, yes. Nowadays, the squirrel explained, the job of guarding the fire of life had been given to the most powerful guard spirits from all the world's dead religions, aka mythologies. Spotted Kerberos, the 50 headed dog of Greece and the former gatekeeper of the underworld, Anzu, the Sumerian demon with the face and paws of a lion and an eagle's claws and wings, the decapitated but still living head of the Nordic giant Mimir, which had been guarding the fire for so long that it had grown into and become part of Mount Knowledge itself, Fafnir, the super dragon as big as the four changes combined and 100 times as powerful, and Argos Panoptes, the cow herd with the 100 eyes. Who saw everything and missed nothing were the five appointed guardians, each of them more ferocious than the last. Ah, said Luca, feeling cross with himself. Yes, I should have expected that. So, as you know everything, can you tell me how I'm supposed to get around that little one? Cunning, said Ratatat. Do you have that? Because a good supply of that is what is recommended. Hermes, for example, tricked 
Argus once by cunningly singing him lullabies until all his hundred eyes closed and he fell asleep. Oh, yes, to steal the fire of life, you'll need to be cunning, devious, sneaky, tricky, weirdly twisted type. Is that, by any chance, the type of type you are? No, said Luca disconsolately and sat down on the grassy slope. I'm sorry to say that I'm not. As he spoke, the sky darkened, storm clouds, black and lightning lit, thickened overhead. Groom, said a terrifying voice emanating from the heart of the clouds. <laughs> In that case, little rat attack translated through teeth that were chattering with fear, you might find this last step a trifle tough. As the gods rose like a swarm of hornets towards the summit of Mount Knowledge, the fire alarm sounded the all clear, announcing the capture of the fire thief to the whole hut of magic. Bear the dog and dog the bear, who were being carried up to the top on the horse king's back, heard the triumphant notes of the siren and were plunged into gloom. Nuthog and her sisters were flying alongside them with their tails very much between their legs. The jig is up, I'm so sorry to say, Nuthog told Bear the dog, confirming their fears. It's time to pay the piper. At that instant, the entire swarm of gods swerved sharply to the left and, to Bear and Dog's amazement, actually tore through the blue sky itself as if it were made of paper and charged through into another sky which was full of storm clouds. The Horse King and his prisoners followed the swarm through the gigantic rip into the left-hand world and Bear and Dog saw for the first time the transformed version of Mount Knowledge, which they both immediately thought to be the loveliest of green hills, even though the sky was dark and menacing and at the moment so forlorn. At the summit of knowledge, there was, was a flower-strewn meadow crowned by a fine spreading ash tree. In spite of the tree's beauty, however, its name was the Tree of Terror, and under its boughs stood, stood Luca Khalifa with a red squirrel on his shoulder and the octopot hanging from his neck, guarded by his captor, Anzu the Sumerian thunder demon with his lion's head and eagle's body, who looked as if he was only just managing to restrain himself from ripping the boy to bits with his enormous claws. The rest of the fire guards, many-hearted Kibros, Mimir the head without a body, Fafnir the super dragon, and Argos Panoptes of the hundred eyes, were also angrily at hand, and beside the great tree was a small, slender columned marble temple, scarcely larger than a humble garden shed. Inside the temple was a light that glowed with an almost shocking intensity, filling the air around the temple with warmth, radiance, and a crackle of energy, even in the thunderous mood of that time of Thalia, captivity and imminent judgment and above the pillared entrance to the temple stood a golden ball the saving point at this impossible level's end that's the glow of fire of life dog the bear growled quietly to bear the dog what a simple home it has at the end of such a grand journey and how close we came and how sad that we didn't bear interrupted bear the dog interrupted sharply don't say that he barked this isn't over but in his heart he believed it was the trial began. Boom! Roared Ra the Supreme, who seemed to have taken charge of events. But The crowd of gods roared back, which is to say roared or shouted or chirped or hissed, depending on the god in question. Boom! <laughs> shouted Ra. Mart has been disrupted and must be restored, echoed the divine mob. <laughs> Ra bellowed. Therefore, let Mart be done. What's Mart? Luca asked Ratatat the squirrel. Ahem, said Ratatat, raising her eyebrows and twitching her whiskers prof professorially. It is a reference to the design, divine music of the universe. Oh, yes. And the structure of the world and the nature of time, the most basic of all forces, which to interfere with is a crime. In short, Luca requested. Oh, said Ratatat, looking a little disappointed. Well, then, in brief, Ra means that the order has been disturbed and justice must be done. Luca discovered all at once that he was feeling extremely annoyed. How dare this posse of has-beens judge him? Who were they to tell him he should not try to save his father's life? This was the moment at which he saw his companions arriving on the scene, and the sight of his beloved dog and bear and the four loyal changers under arrest increased his irritation. These supernatural pensioners had some nerve, he thought. He would have to show them what was what. <laughs> cried Ra the Supreme and then Ella I'm not going to read the rest of it because it's um oh yes Tia X is showing you very long <laughs> uh -huh, etc 
Do I have to translate all that? Said Ratatat reluctantly. Yes, Luca <laughs> insisted. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately for you, said Ratatat, sighing a little, I have an excellent memory and an obliging nature as well. You won't like it though. <clears throat> Once and for all, she began, the members of the real world must be shown that they are not permitted to the use of fire of the fire of life. It cannot revive the dead, for they have entered the book of the dead and are no longer beings but only words. But to the dying it gives new life, and in the healthy it can induce great longevity, even on mortality, which belongs to the gods alone. The fire of life must not cross the boundary and enter the real world, and yet here is a fire thief who plans precisely to take it across the forbidden frontier. An example must be made. Oh, is that so, said Luca. A fire of his own making had in, risen in his breast and blazed through his eyes. The strange inner force that had gripped him after Nobodaddy's disappearance rose up again and gave him the strength he needed. As it happens, he realised, I know exactly what to say. Then he called out so loudly to the assembled ex-gods that they stopped roaring and hissing and chirping and whinnying and making all the other weird noises they habitually made and fell silent and listened. It's my tur to turn to speak now, Luca hollered at the assembled supernatural beings. And believe you me, I have a lot to say about all this poppycock and you had better listen closely and listen well because your future depends on it as much as mine does. You see, I know something that you don't know about this world of magic. It isn't your world. It doesn't even belong to Arlene, whoever they are, where, to the Arlene, whoever they are, where, whether they are lurking, wherever, bleh, wherever they are lurking right now. This is my father's world. I'm sure there are other magic worlds dreamed up by other people, Wonderlands and Narnias and Middle-earths and whatnots. And I don't know, maybe there are some, some such worlds that dreamed up, dream themselves up. I suppose that's possible, and I won't argue with you if, if you say it is, but this one, gods and goddesses, ogres and bats and monsters and slimy things, is the world of Rashid Khalifa, the well-known ocean of notions, the fabulous Shah of Blah, from start to finish, level one to level nine and back again, lot, stock and barrel, from soup to nuts, it's his. He put it together this way, he gave it shape and laws, and he brought all of you here to populate it because he has learned about you, thought about you and even dreamed about you all his life. The reason this world is the way it is is because is because right-handed or left-handed, nobody's world or the world of nonsense and this is the world inside his head and I know about it. Probably that's why I was able to stumble to the right and step to the left and get here because I've been hearing about it every day of my life as bedtime stories, as breakfast sagas, as dinner table yarns, as tall tables told to audiences all over the city of Kahani and the country of Alif Bay and also as little secrets he whispered into my ears just for me and so in a way it's now my world too and the plain truth is that if I don't get the fire of life to him before it's too late he isn't the only one who will come to an end everything here will vanish too. I don't know what will become of you you all exactly, but at the very least, you won't have this comfortable world to live in anymore. This place where you can go on pretending you matter when actually nobody gives a hoot. And in the worst case scenario, you will disappear completely, poof, as if you've never been. Because let's be frank, how many people other than Rashid Khalifa are really bothering to keep your story going nowadays? How many people know any more about the salamander that lives in fire or the squawk that is so sad about being ugly that it actually dissolves into tears? Wake up and smell the coffee, old timers. You're extinct. You're deceased. As gods and wonderful creatures, you have ceased to be. You say the fire of life mustn't cross into the real world. I'm telling you that if it doesn't reach one particular member of the real world, double quick, you're done for. Your golden eggs are fried and your magic goose is cooked. Wow. Right attack, the squirrel whispered into his ear. You've certainly got their attention now. The entire army of discarded divinities had been shocked into amazed silence. Luca, under the tree of terror, knew that he mustn't let anything break the spell. And besides, he had plenty more to say. Shall I tell you who you are now? He shouted. Well, first I'll go on reminding who you aren't. You aren't really the gods of anywhere or anyone anymore. You no longer have the power of life and death and salvation 
and damnation. You can't turn into bulls and capture earth girls or interfere in wars or play any of those other games you used to play. Look at you. Instead of real power, you have beauty contests. It's a bit on the feeble side, to be honest with you. Listen to me. It's only through stories that you can get into the real world and have some sort of power again. When your story is well told, people believe in you. Not in the way they used to believe, not in a worshipping way, but in the way people believe in stories. Happily, excitedly, wishing it wouldn't end. You want immortality? It's only my father and people like him who can give it to you now. My father can, pe can make people forget that they forgot all about you and start adoring you all over again and being interested in what you've been getting up to and wishing that you wouldn't end. And you're trying to stop me? You should be begging me to finish the work I came here to do. You should be helping me. You should be putting the fire into my hot pot. You're making sure it lights up my hot potatoes and then escorting me all the way home. Who am I? I'm Luca Khalifa. I'm the only chance you've got. It was the greatest speech of his life as a performer, delivered on the most important stage on which he had ever set foot. He had used every ounce of skill and passion in his body, that was true, and he had carried his audience with him. Maybe so, he thought worriedly, and maybe no. Bear the dog and Dog the Bear, still on the horse king's back, were shouting out supportively, yelling, back to telling them, and so on. But the silence of the gods grew so dense and so oppressive that in the end, Bear held, even Bear held his tongue. That awful silence went, went on thickening like fog, and the dark skies grew darker until the only light Luca could see was the glow from the fire temple. And in that flickering radiance, he saw the slow movements of giant shadows all around him. Shadows that looked like they were closing in on the Tree of Terror, and the boy who stood captive beneath it with the Sumer Sumerian thunder demon as his guard. Closer and closer the shadows came, forming themselves into a single giant fist that was closing around Luca and would any moment now squeeze the light, life out of him like water from a sponge. This is it then, he thought. My speech didn't work. They didn't buy it. And so here's an end to it all. He wished he could hug his dog and his bear once more. He wished the people he loved were there to hold his hand. He wished he could wish himself out of this germ. He wished the mountain of knowledge began to shake violently, as if some invisible colossus were jumping up and down on its slopes. The trunk of the tree of terror cracked from top to bottom, and the tree fell in ruins to the ground as its crashing branches narrowly missed, missing Luca and the thunder demon. One falling branch struck Mimir the head, Mimir the head and he unleashed an injured yelp. From among the ranks of the gods and monsters, there were many more cries of anguish, bewilderment and fear. Then came the most terrifying events of all. There were instants, very brief, fractions of seconds, when everything completely disappeared. And Luca, Bear and Dog, the three visitors from the real world, remained suspended in an appalling, colourless, soundless, motionless, lawless, everythingless absence. Then the magic world came back again. But a horrible realisation began to dawn on everyone and everything there. The world of magic was in trouble. Its deepest foundations were shaking. Its geography was becoming uncertain. Its very existence had begun to be an intermittent on-off affair. What if the off moments started getting longer? What if they began to last longer than the on ones? What if the on moments, the periods of the world's existence, diminished to split seconds or even vanished entirely? What if everything the fire thief had just told them was the naked truth in which they had until now refused to believe, closed as they all were in the tatters of their old divine glory and remnants of their pride? Was this the bare, unvarnished reality that their survival was tied to the ebbing life of a sick and dying man? These were the questions plaguing all the inhabitants of the magic world. But in Luca's panicked, racing mind, there was, there was a simpler, more horrifying query. Was Rashid Khalifa about to die? Anzu the thunder demon fell to its knees and began to plead with Luca in a soft, sad, piteous voice. <laughs> Ratatat was so scared that her voice shook as she translated the Sumerian. Save us, sir. Only please, sir. We don't want to be just fairy tales. We want to be revered again. We want to be divine. Sir, huh? Luca thought that's a change of tone if ever I heard one. Hope surged through his body. 
fighting against his despair, and he rallied all his strength to wait, make one last effort and said with all the force he could command, take it or leave it, all of you. It's the best offer you're going to get. The darkness stopped closing in around him. The wrath of the gods wavered, overcome by their fear. It broke into pieces and dissipated completely to be replaced by abject terror. The clouds of anger parted, the daylight returned, and everyone could see that the rip in the sky through which the god swarm had poured had grown ten times as large as before, that there were actually cracks running across the heavens from horizon to horizon, and that the army of mythological figures was itself deteriorating, aging, cracking, fading, weakening, diminishing, and losing the ability to be. Aphrodite, Hathor, Venus, and the other beauty goddesses looked at the wrinkled skin on their hands and arms and shrieked, smash all the mirrors! And the immense figure of the falcon-headed Egyptian supreme deity fell to its knees just like Anzu had, its body beginning to crumble like an ancient monument, and all the other gods followed Ra's lead, or at least those of them who had knees. In a low, respectful, frightened voice, Ra the Supreme said, <laughs> What did he say? Luca asked Ratatat, who had started jumping up and down on his shoulder, squeaking loudly. He says they'll take it. Your offer, that is, squeaked Ratatat in a voice that was simultaneously relieved and terrified. You can take the fire now. Hurry, what are you waiting for? Save your father, save us all. Don't just stand there, move. Shadows rushed across the sky above their heads. Well, will you look at that, said the welcome voice of the Insultana of Ott. I thought I was leading my loyal Otter Air Force on a doomed but gallant rescue attempt of an incompetent but oddly likable young fellow, because in spite of your foolhardiness, in the final analysis, I couldn't stand by and leave you to your fate with only my honorary Otter Ratatat to represent me. But I see, to my considerable surprise, considering what a foolish boy you are, that you have managed pretty well on your own. There, in the newly cloud-free but also decaying sky above the Mountain of Knowledge, was the entire OAF on its flying carpers, with quantities of rotten vegetables and itching powder paper planes at the ready, and Queen Soraya at their head aboard Resham, the flying carpet of King Solomon the Wise, along with Coyote the decoy runner, the elephant birds. We came too, they shouted down. We don't just want to remember stuff, we want to do stuff too. And a male stranger of great age and improbable size, who was also completely naked, with a heavily scarred midriff. Luca didn't have time to reply to anyone or to ask who the naked stranger was or even to embrace Bear and Dog who had jumped off the horse king's back and rushed to his side. I have to get the fire, he cried. Every second counts. Bear the Dog reacted at once and charged at breakneck speed into the fire temple to return a few seconds later with a burning wooden brand between his teeth ablaze with the brightest, most cheerful, most attractive, most hopeful fire Luca had ever seen and Dog the Bear climbed the columns of the fire temple and, with one great paw, hammered the golden ball over the entrance as hard as he could. Luca heard the telltale little ding, saw the number in the top right-hand corner of his field of vision click up to eight, grabbed the burning wood from Bear's jaws and plunged it into the ot pot, whereupon the little ot potatoes began to burn with the same heartwarming, optimistic cheeriness as the stick. Let's go, yelled Luca, hanging the pot around his neck again. Its warmth felt comforting as Soraya swooped down to allow Luca, bear and dog to leap up onto King Solomon's carpet. No faster mode of transport in the whole magic world, she cried. Say your farewells and let's be on our way. Then Nuthog and her sisters and the squirrel Ratatat shouted, No time for that, goodbye, good luck, go. And so they did. Soraya's carpet hurtled back through the rip in the sky. You came in from the right-hand world, so that's the way you'll have to go back out, she told him. The rest of the Otter Air Force followed, but the carpet of King Solomon was flying at its very fastest, and the others were soon left behind. Don't you worry, said Soraya in her most determinedly cheerful voice. I'll get you back in time. After all, it turns out that you have our whole world to save you, as well as your dad. No, wait. Sorry, I'm going to have to no. redo that. That's not what no. it says, Ella. <laughs> No. After all, it turns out that you have a whole world to save as well as your dad, which is very, very different. different from what I just said. <laughs> Ta-da! End of chapter seven. I think that was a good chapter. I think that was a good chapter too. I like his speech about the imaginary world and, and, and it being alive in his father's dreams. I mean, it's very cinematic. It was very cinematic, that one, wasn't it? Very yeah, cinematic. I see all the crashing. I saw, yeah, the... I saw the big um, gaping hole in the sky as well. Yeah, I saw that. I saw the the, the tree crack. Yeah, I saw the deities, uh, some of whom had knees, some of them didn't. I saw them. Yeah, well, I saw when they like came to a crumbling halt and they went... 
fell over each other or something. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, we've got one more chapter to go. One more chapter. Is it a long one or not? Uh, yeah. It yes, it is quite long. It is the. No, it's not. It's 10. It's, it's 27 pages. I think we can do it in one go. Yeah. We'll have to book it next week. In next June. week. Okay, Happy we'll, we'll stop recording now. Two weeks later. Bye. Weeks later. <laughs> Bye, Ella. Bye, Bye Ella. Sprouts. Bye-bye, Alfalfa.